All right, thanks for having me here. Um, this uh, is a um, joint project um, with a bunch of people who are all Michigan when we started it. So C.J. Labasi was a um, master's in public policy student uh, who came on to be a re research assistant for our group. Catherine Mitchell Moore uh, was a postdoc, uh, has now moved on to Syracuse, and Stephanie Owen is a doctoral student in, um, in economics and public policy. And they do all the work uh, is a good way to think about it. Uh, so, uh, and this project is done um, as a result of cooperation, um, uh, an initiative by the University of Michigan Office of Enrollment Management, uh, who helped make this stuff happen, and the state of Michigan, who provided the data that let us get at the universe of public school students in the state. So there's a lot um, uh, going on here. I'm very proud of, of everything we did here. All right, so this is, uh, to sort of set the stage, this is joint work with somebody who was an assistant professor of economics at the time when I wrote with her, Martha Bailey, um, uh, looking at um, what the mobility, income mobility is, um, uh, uh, what the likelihood is of people from different parts of the income distribution, lowest quartile, top quartile, uh, to go to college in two different birth cohorts, early um, 60s, and late 70s, um, early 80s. Uh, and so this is uh, those who have any college experience, you know, one semester of college is from NLSY. And so for this older, older cohort, you can see that for the lowest income in this older cohort, 19% um, went to college. That jumped to 29% for the next cohort. Uh, for this earlier cohort, the gap between the bottom, is that me making noises, and the top, 19 versus 58 percent, so a pretty big gap, and it didn't close um, if you look on, right? So if anything, this gap is a bit larger um, than that one down there. Uh, so um, uh, 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 the jump was larger for the higher income um, folks than for the lower income folks. And so what we see right now, or for these cohorts um, who are now in their 30s, 40s, uh, the gap in college attendance is 29% versus 80%, uh, um, 51 percentage points. So, and this is this change over time between these two cohorts is when the Pell Grant was introduced and student loans were introduced and a whole lot of policies focused on compensating um, for disadvantage, economic disadvantage um, uh, went into place in K-12 and in higher education. So um, that these gaps have persisted is, um, in part a puzzle and also a policy challenge. This looks even worse uh, if you look at college completion. So this is now, do you get a BA? And this is still unconditional. So both of those, you know, this is like, you have to go through each of the hoops. You need to graduate high school and you need to uh, get into a university and then you need to graduate. And the denominator is the entire, entire birth cohort. And so you can see, I'm over here. I didn't know how rare I was, but 5% of kids from the lowest income quartile for this cohort got a BA. And it's 9% now, which is pathetic, right? So this is a terrible number. You know, 9% versus 54%. So these are enormous differences in um, the likelihood of ending up with a BA. You know? and, so, and also, when you, when you hear, uh, and, and this is quite definitely, this has steepened more than the previous figure had. So it's the complete, completion margin that is actually the one where we're seeing the greatest um, growth and disparity. So this is sort of a parallel shift, roughly, um, but this one we definitely see a steepening. And in fact, low-income students are about twice as likely to drop out of college as upper-income upper students are. And so every point along the pathway um, to college through college, low-income students um, tend to fall off. Um, and uh, understanding this and um, changing it has pretty much been what my, um, my career has been about, so my research career has been about. So financial aid, um, uh, college prep programs in high school that help to reduce gaps, uh, uh, early childhood programs that help to reduce gaps, middle school, anything, you know, I do program evaluation and I focus on programs that can reduce inequality in education. So, uh, and you know, this, this is the end of a long pipeline in which low-income kids fall off a bit at a time. Um, uh, and so we need work at every point along the pipeline, and that's what this project is. If you um, made that even more refined and focused on the likelihood of graduating from a selective institution, like Stanford or University of Michigan, these differences would look even starker, 
or it'd be hard to even see them because the, the, um, the likelihoods for the low-income students would be like less than 1%. You know, it starts to asymptote to zero uh, if you add on PhDs and you add on masters. Um, uh, and even, you know, part of this, as I said, is a pipeline issue. You know, that, that, that many um, low-income kids make it to, if they make it to high school graduation, do so with scores, grades, preparation that are not um, robust enough to go to one of the elite schools. But even if you do focus on those who do have excellent scores and excellent grades, uh, Caroline Hoxby here in the econ department, Chris Avery, um, showed even in that group you see big gaps by income. So even the kids who managed to make it through and perform as we expect we would like them to if they were going to go to an elite school, the low income kids are much less likely to go to an elite school. This you pair with evidence that it actually matters if you go to a selective college. So in our system of post-secondary education, um, selectivity and quality go together pretty tightly. And the graduation rates are highest at places like Stanford and University of Michigan, and they're lowest at the for-profits and the community colleges. And we've got strong evidence um, uh, um, from a number of sources that if you get to an institution with more resources, you are more likely to actually graduate. So, you know, that these students are not going to these more selective institutions means in part that they are less likely to graduate and get that BA. If you look at what's been trending in earnings in the U.S., if you look at what's been happening to the income distribution, the BA is the dividing line. Some college looks a lot like high school in terms of what wages have done. Uh, BA is what's separated, and even further, it's getting a master's degree. That's where the, the, the greatest wage growth has been and where the inequality has really emerged. So you need to get uh, we, uh, a part of income mobility in the U.S., I would say, is, um, is about getting low-income students into and through college. All right, so uh, our context is, is, is Michigan. Uh, nothing has been blinded here. Um, uh, the focus is going to be University of Michigan. And in University of Michigan, it's all kind of, you know, University of Michigan is the most selective um, school in the state. And we see a pattern here that follows, it's similar to what we see nationwide. Um, for a low-income student, so this is this line here, for a low-income student, a selective school, a very selective school like Michigan is actually cheaper than uh, uh, the next one down, which is Michigan State University, because we meet need and MSU does not. Even at Eastern, again, it's substantially more expensive, so the net cost is about $6,600 uh, at University of Michigan for this low middle income um, student, 12,000 at these other four year institutions. You'd have to be going to a community college in the state to get to a lower, substantially lower price. The graduation rate differences are also quite stark. 90%, 78%, 38%. These are the directionals. We've got an Eastern and Western and Northern. Um, and then 16% at the community college. And salaries um, uh, track this as well. So. Um, Michigan looks like the rest of the country in all of these things. So um, the genesis of this um, project was that the pro provost uh, for, he had some fancy name, but it was like vice provost for, you might know the different provost names, for budget stuff. Right? I don't think stuff was in the name, but he was a vice provost for budgetary things. And he was a person in charge that in his, in his portfolio was admissions and financial aid, Al Franzblau. Um, he's now back to happily being back to being a scientist. He's rotated out of, of administration. But he um, he knew of my work and he asked me to come talk to his staff retreat, uh, which included admissions and financial aid, and talk to him about the work I'd done on simplification, on on income inequality, in in um, educational outcomes. And I did. I went and had you know ate my sandwich and did my shtick. And what was different was that after that he called and he said, "What can we do?" okay, um, I don't know what we can do, um, but let's talk about it and think about it. And he convened a group of people from admissions, financial aid. Um, he put some money behind it. He showed up at the meetings to show that it was an important thing that mattered and to get people on the same page. I said, if we're going to do something, we're going to do it with a randomized trial, so we'll actually know if it works. Uh, and we started exploring the data and seeing what the situation was, uh, getting a diagnosis of what was happening. You know, they wanted to get more low-income Michigan students into University of Michigan. So uh, their perception, as tends to be the perception at elite schools, was that there are not enough low-income, high-achieving students for them to recruit. So the problem is with the K-12 system, and the K-12 system needs to get fixed, and well, we can't do that, so we'll just throw up our hands. And so I wanted to actually check the data on this 
and have, having been in a partnership with the state of Michigan for 10 years, had access to, um, been working with them on um, their administrative data, I could go and look at the universe of public school students in the state. We are a universal SAT state. They take it in the schools in their junior year for free on a school day. Everyone takes the SAT. Um, uh, we've got markers for whether somebody is a um, free and reduced price lunch student or not. Right? So that's the low income students. And then the green is the non low income students. So Michigan administrative data. And then we matched it to national student steering clearinghouse data so we can see nationwide where they go to college. So we've got 11th grade students in Michigan public schools. And here, this is before we start our experiment, um, who meet, so, so we, we asked admissions, who is recruitable? Who would you focus on? And all schools have a, a set of students whose GPA, whose ACT is in the neighborhood that they buy scores from ACT or SAT, right, and start recruiting them. Um, uh, so we set some um, criteria, pulled those students from the data, and then looked at what was happening to those students in terms of, um, in terms of college going. And what you could see was that even, and these are students who, you know, these are pretty high ACTs, pretty high GPAs. GPAs 3.7 and above, ACTs, um, you know, in the top 10%. Um, uh, even on uh, going to college at all, there was a gap between the lower income and the higher income. That gap got bigger when you got, here is Michigan, so highly competitive or above, 14% um, of the low income kids were going to a highly competitive or above school, which in Michigan is basically University of Michigan. Um, and then you'd have to go nationwide to find other schools. 22% of the non-low income kids. Right, so, and um, a good chunk of them going to community colleges, non-competitive schools. So there seemed to be some, as economists would put it, money on the table. There were people, as, as, as the uh, Hawksby and Avery uh, uh, research had shown, so this is um, uh, work uh, that they had done. Um, this is a busy, um, busy slide, but what do we have here? This over here is low income students. This is non-low income students. Um, these are all very high achieving students, like in the top 3% of the SAT distribution. And we're looking at where they apply to school. So what I showed you is where people go to school. This is where they apply. And what you see for the high income students is that they're kind of doing what the college counselors dream they should do, which is you apply to a reach, you apply to a safety, right? And very few of them are applying to a completely non-selective school. Less than 10% are applying to a non-selective school. If you go over to the low-income kids, the plurality of them are applying to non-selective schools. And then here, you know, zero, this is all centered around what your own score is. So this takes the difference between your own SAT score and the median score of the institution you're applying to. So dead at zero would be that you are, that's you know, your sort of exact match, reach, down. It's just like scattershot. Right? This is just sort of all over the place. This was me. You know, I had heard of Harvard, so I applied to Harvard. Um, but I also you know, applied to UMass Boston. And I ended up comparing the aid that UMass Boston offered me to the aid that Harvard offered me and chose Harvard based on price. It was the cheapest place for me to go when I decided to go. And I was lucky, but this scattershot approach in general seems to be where a lot of the um, problems emerge. It is not that low-income students are applying to and being rejected by selective institutions, so they don't apply in the first place. So getting more applications in seemed to be our task, and that's the task we set ourselves to. All right, um, so student application and enrollment behavior seems to explain much of the undermatching um, uh, with high ability, low income students attending colleges with much uh, lower average peer achievement um, than their own. Okay, so, you know, there had been um, some work in this area, quite a bit of work, um, economics education, higher education has really taken off. Um, and what have we seen that worked? Well, uh, Eric Bettinger right here, uh, along with co-authors, showed that simplifying the financial aid process uh, had an impact on enrollment, especially for low-income students. Um, uh, Hawksby, along with Sarah Turner, had shown that um, sending um, semi-personalized information to high-achieving low-income students um, uh, on the cost of their local colleges, as well as REACH colleges, increased enrollment at the selective colleges. So this was the ECO experiment, Expanding College Opportunities experiment. So it showed a boost of five percentage points. So this one in particular we were leaning on quite a bit. But also this one, the simplification stuff. Um, more intensive uh, um, uh, mentoring programs um, seem to be doing something as well. So uh, uh, Scott Carroll and Bruce Sasserdote 
um, um, set up intensive mentoring programs with Dartmouth students for local students in New Hampshire and, and Vermont, um, and got some good boosts um, among female students in particular. Their information interventions did nothing. You know, so they tried some sort of information simplification interventions and got nothing. It was the, it was the intensive stuff that worked for them. And um, again, um, uh, you know, the same Bettinger and all um, uh, uh, study, you know, they had found that if you basically did the FAFSA for people, it increased the likelihood that people went on to college. Um, they also had an arm of that experiment in which they gave people very precise information about their financial aid eligibility based on their tax data. That did nothing. So very, very uh, uh, um, personalized information about the cost of college, what financial aid would look like at nearby institutions did, did nothing at all. All right, so, you know, what did we, um, and this is how we were, you know, we sort of went through this and did a presentation like this um, um, with the, the folks at Financial Aid and Admissions. Um, you know, it seemed to be um, that uncertainty was a big issue. People don't like uncertainty. Um, people don't know, especially low-income students are poorly informed about the cost of college, about their ability to get admitted to a selective institution, and whether attending a selective institution is actually worth it. Um, uh, uh, logistical barriers, applications, what we might think of as small paperwork burdens matter a lot. And we've seen that not just for college, potential college students, but also for people saving for retirement. So in, in lots of contexts, this has been a revolution in econ to understand that minor barriers can have big impacts. And this is what has arisen, this is where um, the field of behavioral economics um, has come from is trying to understand in what situations those minor barriers seem to matter. So what matters? The FAFSA, filling out the FAFSA, filling out the profile, which is another aid application that people need to do. Application fees, um, all of these um, create barriers for lower income students. In theory, a lot of these problems are not supposed to exist because, for example, there are application fee waivers for low income students if they go to their college counselor and get the waiver and insert it in their packet. There are waivers, ditto for the profile. These things are underused. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, you don't feel like going to talk to the counselor because they don't like you and they don't think that you're college material or the counselor has run out of the stuff. Stuff happens. We see the same thing. You know, uh, Richard um, Thaler calls this sludge. Um, so it's stuff that basically administratively chokes um, programs that are intended to, to help people um, that the process of getting into them can be so sludgy um, that they don't actually get into these programs. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the previous literature, information alone, which economists love, right? If you've got perfect information, you're all set. Um, just giving people information doesn't seem to do much. And that um, a pattern in the effective program seems to be that there is um, either support from adults or replacement of the support that adults would typically provide. So for, you know, uh, a kid whose parents went to college, they're going to register them for the SAT and they're going to drive them to the SAT on a Saturday morning in an outlying suburb and they're going to cook them a good breakfast in the morning and yada, yada, yada. And have a credit card to register that all these little things that an adult can do, um, you can think of as the things that are effective if uh, the school does it instead or the school system does it instead. All right, so this was the set of, um, set of lessons that we drew. So what did we design? We um, um, uh, hit upon um, offering a simplified and early commitment of aid to these students. So we were going to commit to four years of free tuition and fees at UM. Uh, we were going to, of course, encourage these students to apply. It was going to be called a scholarship as opposed to a grant. And we were going to um, offer it with no strings. So you didn't have to fill out the FAFSA or the profile. If you got into Michigan, you were going to get this no matter what. If you also did the aid forms, you were likely to get more. And the aid office was very hyper about that. They didn't want to discourage people from doing the FAFSA and the profile because in expectation, these folks were actually going to get a free ride, not just tuition and fees, but also their room and board. Right. Um, it was delivered uh, um, in the form of a mailing to students at their homes, to their parents at their homes. And as you're going to see, we randomized this at the high school level. And so we sent to principals a list of which students um, were going to be eligible, a description of the program, um, and uh, contact information. So this is what it looked like. 
Um, we, our colors are maize and blue, if you can't tell. Um, where's light? Where's our student light? You're wearing, oh, let's see. Yep, so there's the maize and blue right there. Yep. <laughs> he uh, tweeted out that he was going to dig out of his closet some maize and blue, and I shot back on Twitter, dig out of closet? <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> so we did not design this. The financial and admissions, you know, we gave them the principles. They did all the designing and, and actually executed the, the intervention, which I, as somebody who's engaged in a bunch of these evaluations at this point, um, think is really important. So I think what doesn't tend to work is when we come in and say, here's what you should do. Please test it. Um, and what's more likely to work is sort of uh, testing with them of things that they have thought about doing, have thought about stopping ceasing to do, um, but make it much more part of their actual work as opposed to here I am with the, here I am from the Ivy League with the, with the, with the secret to your success. So this got mailed to homes in late August, early September. Um, we were aiming to get stuff in people's hands early so they could do the early um, action deadline of no November 1st, which Michigan, like many places, more than half of the students are admitted at that time. It would be personalized with their, with their own names. All this was possible because of the partnership with the state. Um, um, this looks like something from um, Alice in Wonderland. So open here, uh, and then personalized, you know, you're awesome. Congratulations. Um, I'm making you this offer, in-state tuition and fees, four years, 60,000. Um, furthermore, after a review of your financial aid applications, you'll likely be eligible. Um, uh, but we, and that's the president signing it. Um, if you open it up and look at all the stuff in here, um, it, uh, somewhere it, it guarantees that you don't have to fill it out. Uh, these are all little coupons that you can pull off. Um, I thought it was important that this stuff be tactile, you know, that you've got a, a waiver on the common application. Because otherwise you have to go get a fee waiver from your counselor. And this is like a replacement for it instead. Um, uh, the admissions people really laughed at me for this one. They're like, you know it's the free application for federal student aid, don't you, Susan? I'm like, yes. I want a coupon. <laughs> Put a coupon in there. Um, and ditto with the, with the profile. So they rolled their eyes, but they, but they did it. All right. And we wanted to see if this worked, so we did this randomized trial. So we identified students who had the ACT and GPA requirements that I talked about, rising seniors. Um, these are the first two cohorts, spring of 15 and 16. Um, uh, first year, there were 2,100 of them in uh, 530 schools. Second cohort, 1,800 of them in 500 schools. And we randomized into treat control at the school level. Um, we did uh, um, some blocking. We had some hint from the previous research that being an isolated student, being like the only low-income, high-achieving student at your high school was particularly um, a barrier. So we did some blocking by the number of Hale students, Hale eligible students that were at each school to see if there were going to be differential effects depending on how large a community of these low income students you had around you. Um, uh, when the second cohort came around, um, uh, any schools that again had students of this, of this, um, of this set of, of, of criteria um, stayed in the same status they were in before. Um, some new schools came in because as you're going to see, in many of these schools there was like one kid. And in other schools, there were zero kids. There's 1,000 high schools in Michigan. So half of them contained one, at least, uh, high-achieving, low-income kid um, uh, in each year. Uh, new schools were, again, randomized in by the number of Hale students. And this is what it ends up looking like in terms of the distribution. Um, uh, so the size of this dot indicates um, how many uh, high-achieving, low-income students there are. This is southeast Michigan, Detroit, Ann Arbor. Grand Rapids, Upper Peninsula, and you can see lots of tiny little dots, and those are the one-offs. That's what Avery and um, Hawksby referred to them as. These are these is isolated students. Uh, a few places had you know, more than 30 or 50 of such students. This is zip code as opposed to school, um, because that's how the mapping software worked. But you can see that there's a lot of isolation, a few students here and there. And this is reflected in the summary statistics. Right, so we've got um, about 4,000 students for these first two cohorts. Uh, this serves as a table that tells you um, both what the sample looks like and to show that we've got balance across the um, treatment and control here. Um, 
uh, um, 15% from the Upper Peninsula, that's that thing on top there, 45% uh, from the West Central area, 40% from the Southeast, about a third of them suburban, um, about half of the schools are rural. Half of the sample of students is not rural, but half of the schools are, are rural, right? So these rural schools would tend to have like one Hale student in them. So this is all weighted by, by school right now. Uh, if we um, uh, uh, look at the student demographic characteristics, um, they're majority female, which is something you see um, in many data sets that the, the more high achieving students tend to be, tend to be girls, they're white. Um, uh, again, as you go up the test score distribution and the grade distribution, um, uh, the distribution is more and more white. Um, by construction, they're all either eligible for a free lunch or a reduced price lunch, and 70% of them are eligible for the free lunch. That's um, at 150% of, of the poverty level gets you the free lunch, and up to 180 um, gets you the reduced price lunch. And to give you a sense, that's like around, we're talking like 40,000 and below for a family of four is, is what this is um, uh, going to be. Uh, we, they switched to the SAT the second year we, we ran this. The state switched to the SAT, so we're going to be expressing things in SAT equivalents. Um, we chose students on kind of a grid basis. If you had a very high SAT, you could get away with a slightly lower GPA and vice versa. Um, uh, very few of them are uh, non-English proficient. Very few receive special education services. Um, only a third of them uh, were, you know, so they, they took their, to get into the sample, they took the SAT and got a certain score. So this is pre-intervention. Um, only a third of them were sending their scores to University of Michigan on the day that they filled out their test. Right? And if you look at their high schools where they're located, the application rate um, at baseline is, you know, uh, this is the entire school, not just for those students, but for the entire school. About 7%, 6% of the school is applying um, to the University of Michigan. Can I ask a quick question about that? Yeah. Do you all have data on where they came from their sample? No. Applications are much harder to, you know, so we could, we could potentially uh, ask the Common App people. I have asked the Common App people, I haven't gotten it yet, but it's much harder to get application information than attendance information. Attendance you can get from NSC. I understand why it would be attractive to have these data, which does not change the answer that I don't have these data. But I'm being snarky. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. That was a perfectly innocent question you were asking there. Yes, I agree completely. You are right. Good observation. Yes, it would be. I would like to know where they're applying. Um, I don't know. It's frustrating, hence the snark. I wish I knew. So the only place I know applications for is University of Michigan, which is in the Common App. So if we could get them to cough up the Common App data, we could see a pretty broader, a broader range of applications. Yep. That was the nationwide data that um, Avery, uh, that, that Hawksby and Turner did um, in partnership with College Board and ACT. And so that was based on essentially, was that score sending or is it from the common app itself? I'm not sure. It's one or the other. But they had, anybody know? No? Okay. It's one of those. Either they had score sending or they had the information from the Common App. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, we sent this thing out. Uh, the student thing went out here. This is the first cohort. Um, and there was a personalized, they call it a pearl, um, personalized, um, in Silicon Valley, you know everything. It's a per little personalized um, URL for each person where they could log on to the University of Michigan website and get information about the scholarship. So we could track when people actually went to the University of Michigan website to learn about this thing. Um, and that's what this is. So um, a few days after the student letter dropped, you see the spike in um, people going to um, the website. Uh, a few days after the parent letter drops, there's a spike in people going to the website. So the parent letter seems to have done something. Um, the, the principals get notified before the stuff goes out to the, to the kids or the parents. So there's no URLs, pearls floating around, so we can't see whether that has any impact in itself. And November 1 is the, is the early action deadline. Um, uh, uh, this is the second cohort. Timing was slightly different. Of course, we had trouble with the, pub the, um, the printers. But again, same, same kind of pattern, um, where each uh, item that went out there seemed to um, uh, lead to an increase in, um, 
in um, uh, seeking out information. They could get a t-shirt. First cohort could get a t-shirt, free t-shirt if they logged on and, and requested it. Second cohort, I think it was fuzzy socks or something or, you know, a water bottle. All right, so results. It's a randomized trial. We compare treatment and control. I'm not even going to show you an estimating equation. Right, so here it is. Control and treatment. And this is application to University of Michigan, which we're getting from their administrative data. Right, so the university gives us their application data. 26% of the control group applied to University of Michigan, and 67% of the treatment group um, applied to University of Michigan. The difference is statistically significant. Um, um, I can show you the standard errors and stuff if you'd like. Uh, um, but this is statistically significant. All right, I'm being snarky again. Um, what time is it for me? All right, I need a drink. All right, so um, uh, um, there's what I just showed you, the application. And then this is admission, and this is unconditional. This is not conditional on applying because that's endogenous, right? So this is like of the, the treatment control group, 15% of it enrolled at University of Michigan. Of the treatment group, 32% of it enrolled at the University of Michigan. Each, each of these, um, each year was about 1,000 students, right? So that's a, uh, um, the difference here, you know, is 170 students. So the first cohort, there were 170 more low-income students at the University of Michigan in the fall um, because of this, which is pretty exciting. Oh, this is the first and second, so it's actually more like 300 altogether. So the difference between these two. Um, uh, that's what I, oh, this is admission, I'm sorry. This is the admission rate. This is the enrollment rate. So 15% were admitted in the control group, 32% in the treatment group. Enrollment, 12% of the control group enrolled, 27% of the treatment group enrolled. And that's where the 150 difference comes from. Um, so that represented about 150 um, students. Okay, and we can do all this with numbers as well as pictures if we so desire. And um, there we can see, you know, the control mean uh, was 26% on application. Here we are actually controlling for the strata dummies and for all the covariates we've got, which are lots. We've got these students longitudinally going back to, you know, when they were in um, grade school. We can control for a lot of stuff. And it's a randomized trial, so it doesn't make a difference, right? So the ultimate effect that we see on enrollment, 14 to 15 percentage point increase. The impact on application, about 41 um, percentage points. So this is way bigger than the eco that, you know, we had um, powered this. We thought we needed two cohorts to detect an effect of the size of the five percentage points that the Hawksby and Turner study had found. Um, and obviously we did not need that. Um, by the time we had the first year's results, um, the uh, deadline had already passed where we had to get the second cohort going. So we ended up doing two cohorts anyway. And as I'll explain to you, we've continued this um, for other reasons. All right, if we break up, um, uh, into these regions that we pre-specified. Um, uh, we filed a pre-specified um, analysis plan, which was fun. Um, the biggest effects, you know, the differences between treatment and control um, are coming from the rural areas. So this is driven by the rural areas. So the largest baseline application rate, because we've got, this is application rate now, was 36% in the southeast near the University of Michigan but it was only 16% in the Upper Peninsula, the most rural part of the state, and 20% um, in the western part of the state, the Grand Rapids part of the state where Betsy DeVos is from. Right? And that was just a fact. I'm just giving you facts. Um, and you know, we basically see a compensatory um, effect where the, um, the regions are becoming a bit more similar. Um, on the enrollment rate, um, similar pattern, right? the biggest jumps are coming from the Upper Peninsula and West Central, um, and less so from the Southeast. Um, that is reflected then in the racial composition. So pretty much the regional differences drive. So who lives in rural areas in Michigan? Whites. So poor whites live in the rural areas of Michigan. Um, and as we saw, the, the sample was 84% white. And the effects, the biggest effects, were on white Asian students, from 23% jumping to 67% um, for blacks who are concentrated in the southeast um, region, where the big schools are, Detroit, Ann Arbor, um, uh, Ypsilanti, um, the overall effect is smaller because they were starting with a larger baseline. 48% um, were applying um, in this sample. 
And Michigan um, you know, had historically made some serious efforts to go after students at schools that were majority black. Um, uh, we lost affirmative action in like 2006 uh, from statewide referendum, no affirmative action allowed. And so the school has been doing, instead of individual based recruitment, focus on inner city schools, right? Do a lot of work. And that shows in the differential rate we see here um, of application by region and by, and by race. Uh, follows through, again, the biggest effects on enrollment um, uh, uh, for this group are coming out of the white Asian, um, smaller effects um, for black and other. All right, and there, same thing, but by on, on a table. Um, the um, women started out with a lower application rate um, than men did, um, with the five percentage point gap. That gap shrunk a bit um, by three percentage points, and uh, even more interesting, reversed or got much bigger. I mean, they're about the same on the actual attendance. So this is admissions policy, essentially. But um, women surged relevant, relative to men on the actual um, uh, attendance. Right? So 28% of the sample versus 22%. So it seems to be getting, and this is, this is a story that comes up in a lot of education interventions, a lot of um, both qualitative and quantitative studies of women versus men about confidence, overconfidence, and willingness to apply to a high prestige school like Michigan. This seems to have pushed a lot more women um, to give it a try uh, and um, ultimately got accepted. All right, again, there's the numbers. All right, so this is what we had sort of um, um, uh, at the start had wondered about, which is uh, the degree to which a previous connection to UM made a difference. So what is this? This is a busy, busy graph here. Um, green is the control schools, and the blue is the treatment schools. And what we have here is, at baseline, the um, share of students at the school who applied to University of Michigan. Not just low-income students, but all students. And you can, you know, in the bottom decile is like nobody. And this is actually more of a decile than a decile. Um, nobody applied. Then 2%, right, goes up to like at the top feeder schools, you know, 80% at some schools are applying to University of Michigan. And the difference between these two bars in each decile is the size of the treatment effect. And what you can see is that, you know, this difference is smaller here than it is here. Indeed, the biggest effects we see are in the schools that started out with the lowest rate of application to University of Michigan. This is based on application in 2015, but if we do multiple years, you know, to see if in the past three years had anybody applied, still it's the, it's the least connected schools that are, that are having the biggest response. So this, you know, what's, we're, I think we're learning a lot from this experiment. There's a lot we're not learning. So what is the mechanism that led these places to send nobody to University of Michigan? and for that number to jump to 65% for the treatment group? Was it the counselors were not advising students to apply? Was it the parents were advising students not to apply? Um, we don't know. Would love to do some qualitative work, do some interviewing. This is not my, my wheelhouse, but I have um, colleagues interested in doing this um, and talking to families both before and after the treatment to see what changes in the dynamic and understand what's going on. You know, our, our approach here was we were expecting like effects of five percentage points, not 40, right, and not, not, not 15 or 20. Um, and so we did not do multiple arms. Right? We just had the treatment and the control. So we did not do anything that would, would let us tease out what of this is the parent letter, what of this is the principal letter. We just sort of threw the whole thing at it to see what we would get. And going forward, we hope at Michigan and other places to try to tease those things out a bit. Pretty much if you, if you start out by doing something teeny and get no effect, you won't get more money to do anything else. So strategically, doing, throwing everything at it and getting a big effect is a better way to be able to continue to test this than to start out with something tiny. Yep. Yep. Did you read the paper? Are you cheating? You didn't? Oh, okay. All right. It's actually not cheating to read the paper, just to be. Huh? Okay, you can. <laughs> that was, I was not, no, and now everyone's uh, is shy. Okay, no, that was not meant to be. It was not required to read the paper before coming to the seminar. 
I bet like none of the faculty in the room actually read the paper. <laughs> they might have looked at my tweet storm about the paper. But um, all right. Now all of that that I just showed, and so I'm going to get to that. I'll show it to you in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. All of that was about attending University of Michigan and applying to University of Michigan. The missing piece was where were we drawing students from? So it took a while for the National Student Clearinghouse data to come through that would let us tell. Because what I couldn't, you know, from the data I just showed you, you couldn't distinguish between us poaching students from Berkeley and us poaching students from the local community college. And I was hoping that we were getting them from the local community college. You know, if we were getting them from Berkeley and Harvard, that was not going to be a big increase in social welfare. Right? So we needed the National Student Clearinghouse data to get at that question because that's nationwide enrollment data. What we had before, what I showed you up to now, was just Michigan enrollment. Okay? So now we have, um, uh, um, this is uh, based on the National Student Clearinghouse um, data. Uh, it's the first and second Hale cohorts. And we are now showing the treatment effects and the control means on attending a highly competitive or above school. So that means a school as competitive as UM or more competitive. And the effect is identical to the effect that we measured before because it's all operating through UM. Right? So um, uh, highly competitive or above other than UM, zero. If we were poaching from those other schools, this would be negative. Right? If we'd been poaching from Berkeley or from other schools more competitive than Michigan, this would be a negative number. And if we, you know, by telling people they were fabulous, encourage them to apply to other such schools, this would be a positive number. But it's zero. I think there's a one in there someplace, like somewhere, like way down the line. But basically, no effect on applications to other schools. Sorry, not applications, enrollment at other schools, because we don't have application data. So zero poaching. Um, uh, this tells us um, where the effects are coming from. So what's the counterfactual? What's the control group doing compared to the treatment group in terms of attendance? Already seen this number, the 14.6 percentage point effect on highly competitive or above. We are getting a 4 percentage point increase in the likelihood of going to any college. So 4% of these kids were not going to go to college at all. So this was a shock to us, was, was bumping up the, the college attendance rate. Uh, another 4% are coming from two-year colleges, community colleges. And um, uh, we have bumped up the likelihood, to some of these two things basically, of going to any four-year college by 7.4 percentage points. Right? And then the remainder, the difference between this and this, is the poaching from other four-year colleges. Right? The 7% of this, 7 percentage points of this, is coming from uh, us getting people from Western Michigan University, Eastern Michigan University, the other um, uh, less selective four-year institutions. So about half of it's coming from people who wouldn't have gone to college or would have gone to a two-year, and about half it's coming from people who would have gone to a non-competitive um, four-year institution. Yep? Um, on net, you know, 4% of them are, they're 4% less likely to go to two-year colleges. Is there somebody, if, if, if there, could, there could be, we don't know what's happening, in, we just see averages. Could it be that some people were induced to go to a two-year college, but even more people were induced to go from a two-year to a four-year? Yep. There's lots of stories that you could tell that's consistent with this. Um, what we get here is the net. We did poach from Michigan State. Are we recording this? Uh, all right, so a uh, quarter of the effect um, is uh, from shifting students into any college at all. Um, and that's a pretty big effect. I mean, that number, that 4%, you know, if you look at the previous literature on financial aid, this is, you know, roughly what people, the effect people would get by, um, from a program that increased grants by, say, 1000 bucks a year. So if you offered somebody a grant of $1,000 a year, four percentage point increase in college attendance is roughly what you would expect to, to see. A simple grant program that's actually quite effective. So um, that this program, this program was not um, an increase in aid for these folks. We made it certain for them. We got rid of the paperwork for them. But they were going to be eligible for free tuition and fees no matter what. What we did was make it certain for them and get rid of the paperwork for them. Uh, I just said all of this, right? Quarter of the effect is two to four year. Other half is less selective four years. No poaching or inducing students into other highly selective institutions. All right. Um, uh, 
This is all of that stuff by gender. Uh, so as we saw before, you know, the enrollment effects um, for the highly competitive was driven by the female. It's, both of them are big. 11 percentage points is big. 17 percent for the females. Um, uh, the four-year effect is about the same for uh, the two genders. The, um, the uh, female effect uh, is, is, is considerably larger um, for enrollment. So a lot of the action is, is coming through the, the girls in this. All right, now persistence. So if we induce these folks into university, and this is, this is the concern people have about overmatch, undermatch. Um, you know, if you get somebody to go to a more competitive school, are they just going to drop out right away? They'd be better off at a less competitive place where they'd, they'd, um, they'd uh, uh, face less competition. And so this is now two years, and we just have this for the first Hale cohort right now. And what we're getting here is, so the first set of columns, this is just the first cohort, so these results are slightly different from what I was showing you before, for um, fall after high school graduation, and then did you attend two consecutive falls um, after high school graduation. And so down here, for the first cohort, the attendance at any college at all was six percentage points. Um, for attending two years is eight percentage points. This is driven by not just the people who wouldn't have gone to college at all, but the people who are now going to a four-year college that they're less likely to drop out of. So the likelihood of completing two years of college, attending two years of college, we don't have credits in this right now, we just have do you show up two falls in a row, has increased by eight percentage points. Um, the likelihood of showing up two years in order to four-year college goes from nine percentage points for the first year to 11 percentage points for the second year. So it's going up, it's not going down. Um, at UM, this part, there is some transfer. People are, some people are transferring down from UM um, and going to another four-year institution. So we do see some transfers. Some people do um, give up um, and, and shift to another institution. But on net, we see increases in attendance and in particular increases in four-year attendance. They're roughly persisting at the same rate as other students at the institution that look like them, at the same rate as other low-income students at University of Michigan. Uh, if we look at this by gender, no particular pattern jumps out except this any college attendance thing. Again, it's driven by women. So um, women are 11 percentage points more likely to be enrolled in any college two years in a row uh, than in the control group. And for men, it's, it's um, smaller and, and not significant. No, no more than for being at Michigan, period. You know, so, but no. And again, what is the scholarship? The scholarship is a guarantee of a floor of this aid. Um, pretty much all of these students, and you know, once they were admitted and they were part of you know, our system, the financial aid office made sure they filled out their financial aid forms. Um, and they got way more than this. They got more than tuition and fees. They also got room and board. Um, so they got more money than, than, they were initially, um, than they were initially promised. All right, this is the question you were asking about spillover effects. Um, how did Hale affect non-Hale students attending Hale high schools? And this would be a question of you know, either students who see their classmates getting this package are either discouraged, I didn't get that package, I'm not going to apply to University of Michigan now even though I've been thinking of it, or she got that package? I, if she can do it, I can do it. You know, so it could go either way. It's unclear which way it would go. Um, and essentially the effects are zero is what we get. So what do we have here? Um, this is the unconditional relationship. Um, so that would be um, a uh, decrease of 1.1 percentage points in the likelihood of, um, of, uh, of applying. When we control, when we looked at the data, we saw that there was a slight imbalance between the treatment and control group and the baseline application rates that seems to be driving this. And when we control for the baseline application rates at these schools, all the other results I just showed you stay the same, but this spillover thing goes away. So um, our conclusion is zero. Um, uh, uh, an alternative conclusion is a very small effect. Um, uh, one thing that's uh, important to know is that during this first year, Michigan grew the class by 600 students. So Michigan was expanding um, during this time. So almost by construction, we're not going to see any effect in terms of um, crowd out of other students in the first cohort. But over time, it's a selective school. And if somebody gets in, somebody else doesn't get in. So we'd expect to see something. Uh, 
and then this just breaks it down by um, the application margin, um, the enrollment margin, and so forth. It's all on the paper. And then I made fun of standard errors, but of course had to then do something fancy with standard errors. So this is, um, uh, you know, did we just pull a sample that randomly yielded these results of a 40% increase in the likelihood of application, and it was just, you know, an in inference mistake. Uh, so because we needed our grad student needed something to be able to do fancy, um, she um, did um, um, randomization-based uh, inference. Uh, 10,000 iterations were basically just kept drawing from the, the, the um, set of high schools um, and assigning to treatment and control. So creating 10,000 um, treatment control comparisons. And the pictures are gorgeous. Right? So here's our estimated effect, and that's um, the effect from the 10,000 iterations. Um, so if, um, what this means is that basically no, we could not have gotten this by chance, right? So none of the randomly drawn samples yielded this effect. We've got a p-value of zero, essentially an actual p-value of zero. None of the 10,000 um, randomly drawn uh, treatment and control groups yielded anything anywhere near um, what we, um, what we were looking for. And to give you context, this, this has been um, done recently um, in the development literature. Um, there's a couple of papers. I think one this just came out in QJE um, that did this for a bunch of existing randomized trials, and about half of them fell out of statistical significance once this approach was taken. So this actually has bite in many settings. I didn't just make up a, a, um, uh, a, um, a test that was going to look good for us. This actually um, knocks out a lot of studies uh, uh, ditto with the um, uh, University of Michigan effect. Um, this is the non-UM effect. This is the poaching or encouraging at other schools. Um, it's zero right in the middle. Um, okay. Now, anybody else want to talk about standard errors some more? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So this is, um, uh, you're not asking enough questions. This is, this is uh, closing with what um, we opened with which is um, this difference between low-income and non-low-income students among high-achieving students, except now we've inserted um, an additional line. So the control group would be business as usual for the low-income, uh, sorry, the control group here would be business as usual for these low-income students. Here's the upper-income students, and in the middle are, is our treatment group who, um, who got the offer of the Hale Scholarship. And basically what you see on each of these outcomes is about a closing about the gap by about half. Um, so seven percentage point gap initially uh, uh, um, uh, um, in um, the uh, attendance rate, just three percentage points um, for, the, for the treatment versus the um, upper income students. And then ditto with competitive or above. Very competitive above, it's actually reversed. Highly competitive above, it's reversed as well. Um, so it cut by about half the gaps between the upper income and lower income high achieving students and the type of schools that they, um, that they attend. Which for an intervention that basically costs nothing, um, we think was pretty good. Uh, so the intervention mailing that packet cost about, um, overall the, effect, the, the cost of the program was about 40, 50 bucks per student um, in the treatment group. Um, uh, the students um, uh, stick around, and so they're getting low-income students are more expensive than upper-income students to enroll in college, so there's that cost. But the marginal cost of this thing relative to whatever financial aid they would have gotten anyway is, is pretty minimal. Now, why did this have such a big effect? Um, you know, I, I showed you the estimates, and now this is back to sort of hypothesizing. You know, we designed this program based on the previous literature and the pattern of, of estimates and findings in the previous literature, and now we're interpreting the results based on uh, an existing literature and updating it with this information. Our, you know, it's, it's a big package, that literally, that gets sent to the students and to the parents and to the principals. We can't separate out what in the message is doing this. Um, uh, I do emphatically don't think that this is simply an information intervention. So this, this was a promise, and it resolved a lot of uncertainty, and it took down a bunch of administrative barriers to financial aid for students, as did the FAFSA experiment. Right, so I consider it uh, more in that line than in the um, information interventions. So it was an unconditional promise of aid. 
um, that came as a scholarship before college application decisions were made. Right? So people, if you don't know how the system works in the US, you typically would not find out about what your scholarship package was until you had applied to a school, been admitted to that school, and then gotten an aid package from that school in spring after you had um, applied and been admitted, which is bass backwards if you're actually trying to affect people's application behavior, which is what the barrier is. Right? So initially they were like, okay, let's experiment with the packages we offer people. And like, but look at the data. The, the gap is occurring at the application margin. So mucking with the, with the um, offer letters might do something, but it's not going to get more people to apply. We need to do something pre-application, which meant the institution making a commitment um, outside of the financial aid system, essentially. We suspect from the graphs that we showed you that getting the parents and principals involved in some way helped to give it some credibility. Um, the parent letters seem to have been an additional nudge that got more people to log on. We got anecdotes of, um, of students going to their counselors, going to their principals, and asking, what is this? The principals and the counselors had the contacts that they already had with the University of Michigan and could call up and say, what is this? So lots of communication back and forth that we think helped with the, um, with the effects. Michigan, it's hard to think of a place where it would be, um, this, this, this would be more effective um, than Michigan. We are the um, uh, most uh, selective school in the state um, and the cheapest place in the state for low-income students. The play, University of Michigan is known statewide, and it's not primarily because of its academics, but because of its football team, right? So the maize and blue is very well known statewide. There is not a, like a recognition problem um, with uh, University of Michigan. Previous studies on scholarship programs, um, um, people had found people just threw out the envelopes. They thought they were scams. You know, they hadn't heard of the Wisconsin Scholarship Institute or something, or the you know, Equalizing College Opportunities Program, and threw them out. U of M was, was well known, and we made it big and flashy so that people would see that somebody was actually had some skin in the game. My son was going through the college application process, um, uh, recruitment process at this time. He was a junior as well. I think he was in the, would have been in the first cohort, but he went to a private school. Um, and when stuff would come in the mail, you know, torrents of stuff come in the mail, he actually started, like, he could pick them up and he would, like, weigh them. And like, oh, they're serious. Right? And, you know, that's, this, this looked serious. It looked like a real commitment. Um, uh, uh, and there are not any other sort of, you know, in California, say you did this um, for, say, low-income students across the state. You need to do this as a joint offer from a whole bunch of selective institutions. Otherwise, Stanford's just going to poach them from Berkeley, or Berkeley's going to poach them from Stanford. You know, a joint offer is what you would want to do, I think, in this, in this case. There was no essential, no, no other institution as selective as, as Michigan in, as University of Michigan in Michigan. And we had universal test taking data. So everybody in Michigan um, takes the test. Everyone in the public schools takes the SAT now. Um, uh, previous research um, um, by some folks who came out of here as well as by um, folks in Michigan had shown that universal test taking reveals a lot of high achieving low income students who would not have taken the test in the absence of the requirement of the free test in the school. So this meant that we were getting at and pushing information out to some students who would not have even taken the SAT if it were not required. So we suspect that's part of it as well. Um, we did not rely on self-reported income information. It may well be that the people who, you know, would be dissuaded from Michigan by a FAFSA are the people who would also be dissuaded from taking the SAT, who would be dissuaded from um, filling in their parents' income information on the SAT if they took the SAT. Right, so mo the, the ECO study, the, the one that um, Hawksby and Turner um, did, relied on self-reports um, on income. Um, to pick out the low-income kids. Um, I don't find 18-year-olds to be reliable responders on their parents' income. Uh, I remember talking to my son about, you know, I was quizzing him about how he filled out the, the survey, the ACT, sur SAT? ACT survey, um, and told him what we were doing and that we were, you know, picking people based on responses. And I asked him out of curiosity, what did you put down for my education? And he said, I left it blank. I'm like, you left it blank. He said, I don't know how many, how many degrees you have. No, it's like, it was top-coded, 
right? <laughs> you could just go in, but you know, this is, and so that, this is him, right? So you know, a lot of the, I, I don't trust the data. In fact, ACT has stopped releasing the income data. I believe they decided that the, the, the information is sufficiently unreliable that they don't want to um, uh, see it used. So our data is based on, you know, whether the kid is eligible for free and reduced price lunch in the schools. 80% of those kids are certified for free and reduced price lunch by being SNAP, by being TANF, um, by being on one of the, um, the uh, uh, social welfare programs in the state. Uh, so um, uh, pretty reliable information about their income eligibility. So we think it's a suite of things. Um, what we want to do going forward is try to unpack it. Um, I'm not going to make this thing less effective uh, in Michigan, um, though there is, we have some latitude you know, as we, the uni university wants to gradually expand this because an additional 150 poor kids each year is actually a big lift for a, a place like University of Michigan. Um, and so as we expand it, we could expand it with pieces of this, right? So one, uh, one, one um, uh, uh, piece of work we're doing is that after they saw the first year results, um, this, the university decided to, uh, uh, a new initiative uh, called the Go Blue Guarantee, uh, which is a statewide commitment that for families whose incomes are below median in the state, which is like $65,000, um, they're guaranteed tuition and fees. So tuition and fees will be covered. Asterisk, if your assets are not above some number, uh, and you need to fill out the FAFSA and the profile, and you need to do it every year. Right, so it's got this one piece of the hail thing and without any personalized mailings to parents or kids. So we, um, since this was the new normal, the new counterfactual, we persisted it, the randomization into a third and fourth cohort, where now we're comparing this intervention to this background program. And if the program works, if the Go Blue Guarantee works as everyone hopes it would, then we would now have zero effects of the Hale Scholarship. Preview, we're not getting zero effects of the Hale Scholarship. You know, but what's the difference? Is it because the kids are being individually notified um, is it because we're making this commitment without requiring the aid forms? So we're gonna, um, we're gonna um, do some experimentation with basically mailing information about the Go Blue guarantee to students. So personalized, but not that um, commitment to four years and they still need to fill out the forms. So try to tease out what it is that's going on. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, a dozen states are doing it. Yeah, no, I think they should, you know, but. The schools don't want to do it with just GPA. So it's more like, you know, will, you know, how many elite institutions have ditched the GPA, uh, sorry, have ditched the SAT and the ACT, uh, a handful. So, um, I don't think the schools would be willing to do this just based on GPA. Now, um, you know, how about using whatever other high school test the state administers? So in 13 states, maybe it's a dozen now, um, this is the required NCLB test um, in, um, or at least it's a required test. In other states, they've got their own standardized tests and you could pick students based on, you know, top 10% of whatever the state test is. That's actually what the Adams Scholarship in Massachusetts is. It's like scoring um, above a certain cutoff on their, um, their 10th grade test. So there, you could use other tests potentially. But you know, the reason why these tests emerged in the first place because it was because of a perceived information gap about what the quality of the schools is and what grades mean in different schools and the institutions looking for some universal um, standard. Uh, uh, you know, do I like the idea of lining the pockets of College Board with lots of these? But it, this should be a universal test. I mean, you have to take it to go to a four-year institution. Um, it shouldn't be, you know, people shouldn't have to pay for this and go to these things on Saturdays. Um, it needs to be an in-school test, and I've written about this. Uh, and therefore, I'm a College Board shill, apparently. Uh, um, already showed you that. Um, you know, what does Hale tell us uh, about student decision making? You know, we hope we learn something about this, about how, so we can generalize. Um, 
you know, sort of standard human capital um, uh, theory doesn't get you very far. Um, uh, you know, you need to bring in something about uncertainty. This did not change the cost of college for these people. And, you know, if you use sort of very standard econ theory, you know, you could say, well, it reduced the administrative burden. And you can uh, monetize administrative burden by counting up the number of hours that somebody would have had to spend filling out those pieces of paper. The thing is, they're high school graduates who have very low wages. So you can't, you can't get very far with this approach in terms of how much this reduces the cost of applying to college. It's a few hundred bucks or something. You just can't get far with standard theory. You really need to move to behavioral econ, um, uh, be thinking about loss aversion um, uh, uh, and other, um, uh, other cues that might have been decreasing the application rate. Um, you know, in the standard theoretical setup, you know, it did reduce uncertainty about the cost. Um, it revealed information, perhaps, to these students that the probability that they would get in, um, the fact that they got this personalized um, uh, um, um, packet and other students did not. And that's it. These are the various people who paid for and provided data for this project. Um, this was a really nice partnership. Um, I was really pleased. Uh, by all the people that we got to the table on this. So the Michigan Department of Education provided the K-12 data, including the, um, the, um, the addresses that let us mail the stuff, uh, um, and IES uh, supported the program. So when you say that intervention only costs $40 to $50, does that mean there was an already existing allocation for low-income students that was just never utilized? Oh, Michigan, Michigan meets need. Okay. Right, these, the promise of tuition and fees if, so what we, as part of the diagnostic process, we took information, we took, uh, we matched, the, we, we looked at students within the University of Michigan who had been FERPL when they were K-12 students and looked at their aid packages. And they were getting tuition and fees plus everything else. Oh yeah, we meet need. Yes, we meet need, which is meeting it 100%. Yes. Do you? This guy's from American here. Okay, all right. All right, all right. So this is no change in their eligibility for aid. I'm not sure what the cost. So the university allocated a budget already, and it just was never utilized by these students. So increasing by whatever it was, whatever it was, twenty percent. Oh yeah, that costs something. When I say when I say it costs, I meant per pupil. Getting more poor students to Michigan costs money. On a per pupil basis, these students are not more expensive. The cost of inducing them into Michigan was near zero. Mm -hmm. Once they got there, they're as expensive as any other low-income student, which is expensive. So in fact, in, as part of the planning process, we were sort of budgeting all this stuff out. And they're like, what if you make the eligibility criteria like this? And eventually, at the fourth iteration, I was like, low-income students cost more than high-income students. And we can't change that. Don't do this if you don't want more low-income students here. Because if they come, they're more expensive than people who pay their own tuition. So that was sort of something I actually had to sort of say in the room. And everyone came to grips with that, um, and, and we moved on. But yes, it costs more to, to enroll low-income students than high-income students. OK, yep. So piggybacking on that, mm -hmm. it sounds like the, uh, the Hill Scholarship and the Michigan Review Criterion is beyond that. It's kind of the formal and public framing of uh, getting somebody to college. A guarantee of it. So, you know, it's not a, just a rebranding, and you still have to go through all the paperwork, but also a guarantee. If your income situation changed, you were still going to get it. So I guess my question is, uh, if this was a formal policy, to what extent were uh, non-Jews and Jews looking at this kind of thing? Did people get out of the Michigan did their best. I mean, they did a lot of recruitment. You know, they actually, you know, I, they, 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 and all the, you know, most of the elite institutions do a lot of outreach. They spend a lot of money on outreach. You know, when, at the start, we sort of said, so what are you doing now? And, you know, all the visits they do, the site visits they do, they're like, we visit every high school in the state. I'm like, every high school in the state? There's a thousand, every high school in the state. I'm like, okay. Uh, um, so, you know, like, we weren't going to do more fairs or more site visits. Plus, you're not going to send. I don't believe that they were sending people to every high school in the Upper Peninsula. I wasn't going to confront them with that, but I don't think they were, right? So doing tons of outreach, intensive outreach, especially in the urban areas. Um, uh, less so in the more scattered rural schools, because I mean, it just, 
it doesn't meet any sort of cost benefit analysis that you would send somebody to meet with one student at a rural school in the Upper Peninsula. It just doesn't make sense. Yep. No, just the junior year. We used it. We did it based on junior year, at the time of the test. Were they were they purple at that time? We experimented with, um, you know, as we were trying to get it that you know everybody who we identified was going to get a full ride at Michigan. We then experimented with what if they were eligible for two years? What if they were eligible for eligible for three years? And that's where another paper that I presented, can Kathy presented it here. Kathy um, Mitchell Moore presented it here. The relationship between test scores and um, uh, length of economic disadvantage, that paper came from this because we were sort of looking at um, uh, how did students differ if you use different um, spans. In the end, it was simpler to just go with a single year. It didn't make much difference on this margin. Eighty percent are direct certified in Michigan, right? So that helps with that. But yeah, if um, um, yep, that's true. Is that, yep. Um, so for the students who, were, who went to Michigan as opposed to going to a two-year school or a four-year school, do you know if, um, it might be too soon actually to know, but if maybe they would have gone to a community college and then transferred to a Michigan through one of, either through like Dearborn or Flint or through the community college to transfer? We, we actually do see some transfers from Dearborn and Flint. So they felt, I didn't, it sort of complicates the discussion, but there were an additional um, set of students who they did not admit, but thought they were actually pretty good students and told them if they went to Dearborn or Flint and did well, they could transfer the next year and um, have the deal. Um, so a bunch of them came through. Um, uh, but yeah, it's gonna take a few more years for us to see that. We basically need multiple years of the NSC to see that. The, uh, the UM, uh, Flint, and Dearborn are on different systems altogether, so we don't actually have their enrollment information. Yep. So, more on the admissions, on the enrollment side of things, uh, you talked about students and movie majors. Can you look into like uh, majors that they're deciding to take? Because like higher income students might have a lot more information about how the market looks like afterwards. So we've got, as, as part of the, um, the data agreement we've got with the state, and, and you know, we, are, we are now the, the gatekeeper for these data in the state, I encourage all of you to think of projects that use Michigan data and apply to the Michigan Education Data Center, which I run, which is all of the data that you see here, um, and we're making it available to outside academics. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing the work on, on making it available. Part of that is transcripts for all the public universities in the state. So if somebody goes to a public university in the state, we see all their courses and their grades and so forth. Major is actually really difficult to pull out of most school data because people usually, they, they switch around their majors and not until they actually graduate will they actually settle on what they're gonna do. But you can see how many credits they've accrued in different, in different fields and what their grades are. So we're waiting for time to pass so that we can look at effects using NSC as well as effects using the, the, the transcript data on um, credits accrued, majors chosen, all that good stuff. Like, what's the best school for a given student? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. You know, so I just. just <laughs> you get handed a Michigan degree. That's why I said that this was probably the simplest place to do this, because it's the most selective school in the, in the state. It's the best resource school in the state. For Michigan high achieving students, it's obvious. In the Bay Area, it's not. In New York, it's not, you know, clear, you know. And so in those settings, if I were to do this intervention, what I would want to do is use the intervention to level the cost playing field across all these choices so students could focus on the other choices, on the other aspects of the choice. So you now know that this consortium of schools is going to give you tuition and fees for free for four years. Pick the one that makes the most sense for you along these other dimensions. Yep. 
No, 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 no double dipping. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. It's a selective school. Can we identify people who are likely to get into Michigan? Right. Not, not very well with test scores, scores and GPA. There's no clear pattern. Um, on this, uh, you know, we tried. I, we wanted to look at like, oh, let's look at it by GPA and let's look at it by SAT. But the thing is, mechanically, based on how we cho chose students, anybody with a really, really high SAT has relatively low GPA and vice versa, which confounds looking at either of those dimensions. And when we did sort of a predictive probability, it just didn't. It was all kind of fuzzy. There was there was nothing clear. I mean. Um, admissions um, offices would love to know how you can identify the students who are, who are going to get accepted to your institution if they apply. And the thing is, at a selective place like Michigan, it's not based just on test scores. It's all the other stuff as well um, that goes into the, the acceptance or rejection. So with just this information, I don't think there's a whole lot we can do. Yep. Yeah, they were in like top 3% or something. Ours was lower. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the mean was like 1250 on the SAT, right? So, yeah, um, considerably lower. Because um, uh, this was just the state of Michigan. It's university. Theirs was nationwide, the very top few percent. Yeah, because, you know, once they were admitted and they were sort of part of the system, the financial aid office hounded them and made sure it got done. But before you've applied, they don't hound you because you haven't even applied, right? So I believe so, yeah. I mean, there certainly was no difference between treatment and control on this. I mean, the one, and the ones who didn't, you know, are the ones they suspect are people who would not have been eligible for any aid at all. There was slippage, you know. So we would get this, we look at the statistics on people who were FERPL and go look at their aid, and we would find that like 95% of them were getting um, a free ride and way more. And we, that's why we were trying to target by, okay, if we look at two years of FERPL and three years, can we get that up to 98%? And we just never could. It could have been that for one year, the family, you know, the, the earners were unemployed. Um, and so that's the kind of slippage you would see by making a guarantee. Some people who shouldn't get the aid are going to. And is it worth it to you to get all the other kids in um, uh, in order to, um, you know, you're willing to basically, I've heard it referred to as rough justice. You know, are you willing to give some people who shouldn't get aid the aid so that everybody else can get it in a simplified way? Yep. Well, we, we took a lot of their best students. They would be displeased um, yeah, with it. Yeah, but in terms yeah. of if they wanted to attract low-income students that would need their admission card. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, well, there's, anybody could use this. A for-profit college could use this, right? This could be used for evil as well as good, right? And in fact, the marketing um, savvy of for-profit colleges is, is, is very strong, and they probably do give this message, right? So any institution could use this. I don't know. But the fact is, low-income students at just about any, you know, um, community college, Pell Grant will cover tuition and fees. They could make this promise as well, right? So, you know, would I want to partner with them and work on this? I wouldn't want to do this except with an institution that meets need because I don't want to make anybody worse off financially by going to this institution. And I wouldn't want to do it at an institution that's got a very high dropout rate, because I don't want to make them worse off, right? But basically what we have here is a set of, you know, we've identified something uh, that is very valuable to students and their families, which is certainty. And other institutions could try to deliver this certainty as well. The federal government could try to deliver this certainty. If you are a kid who is free and reduced price, you, the federal program 
you get free and reduced price lunch in the schools, you know, we will cover your tuition uh, up to the value of your your local um, uh, your local um, uh, flagship or something like that. There are there are ways to make this happen. So traditionally, this is what government does: is that government ensures people against uncertainty, and 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 um, we just haven't done that in financial aid. We leave it to the individual students. The students have asked for it, so the Hale students want it. There wasn't any, um, really, and so and then they did focus groups, and um, um, the students were complaining about it that they felt like you know they they got here and they couldn't find each other, uh, and so now they've at least instituted a few orientations and sort of social um, events where the students can find each other, and the students are asking for more, you know. So after this first, I think it was after this first cohort got in, that the um, the university opened a first gen center. So there had not been like a physical space for first-gen students to be in, you know, there was a black student center, a Hispanic student center, Asian American, but there was not like a first, and, and now there is. So they're coming on campus and they're demanding things, which I just think is great. I would love to be able to experiment with supports for these students. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing is, this is, admissions is centralized, financial aid is centralized. Um, uh, but uh, advising, mentoring, academic support is the schools. And so, you know, um, but, you know, I could try to partner with one of the schools, one of the larger schools, to work on some supports once students um, arrive. But I haven't gotten a, a taker yet. Nobody's, nobody's invited me to lunch yet. Five minutes. Okay. So like, I know I've seen a few of them that are big on um, in, in admitting people to communities, so it's like the Hawaii community, the Amish college, different right. colleges, but it's like, yep. do you have any, have you looked at any of the data that says where like, like this um, go to their credit? I have not. Um, it's doable. You know, it's certainly doable. Um, you know, the thing is, once, once you are, um, the, the treatment control comparison is gone once you limit yourself to the students who are at Right, because a selected set of the treatment group is at Michigan, the selected set of the control group is at Michigan. You can't do comparisons, but you could do some qualitative work to try to see, um, you know, where they're going, and compare them to similar-looking um, um, first-gen students uh, and see what the patterns are like. Um, the university has made um, uh, the availability of such data to um, its researchers a big priority. So we've got something called the Learning Analytics Task Force. Um, has been creating, um, you know, sort of a researcher-friendly data set that lets you analyze this kind of stuff, and they're particularly interested in the learning communities. Yep. So you're saying like that you regret about the process, and that you do think that like the learning community is going to be better than the community you're in, or what was the thinking on that? Well, if I'd known it was going to be such big effects, I would have had three arms, right, and and tried to tease out some of this stuff, but. You know, no, I, I, well, you know, I'm not, I, I don't do regrets very well, so no. Um, <laughs> yep. I'm interested in um, what your thoughts are about the movement of the computer. Like, if you think that the SAT has kind of driven the computer, does that shape the trajectory of yep. the computer in the longer term? And that's something we've been talking to the, you know, the universities um, got a whole bunch of partnership programs with, um, with high schools urban high schools, because you need a critical mass of students for this to be worthwhile. So they're like, can we do the same thing, you know, for the Hale students? It's like, the modal number, I didn't show that, that, that statistic, the modal number of Hale students at a given school was like two. So no, you know, you, you probably can't create an entire program around um, two students at a school. Um, so you probably need a different strategy for these rural schools. But, you know, could we do some experimental work, you know, identifying students based on their eighth grade test scores, right? So the, the um, students take uh, this test in eighth grade and then 11th. Not everybody takes the PSAT. It's going to be a selected set of students in some districts that take it, and it's going to be the ones that are already sort of focused on getting their kids into college. Um, 
And that's sort of the process you need to go through. How can you cast the widest net and identify students early? And then what are you going to do with them? I mean, I know financial aid, I knew that literature. Um, you know, the more intensive stuff is way more expensive. Right? So if you're going to do some sort of, you know, this is basically, you know, here, here's something cheap that, that does something. Um, uh, getting more students into the 2,000, you know, making the 2,000, 3,000 is a lot more work and a different kind of work. Should it happen? Yes. Yep. Um, you know, it's in our um, state um, registry of educational professionals. Um, uh, I imagine we have like where they went to school. We know how many counselors there are per student, that kind of thing. I would, I would bet so. I would bet so. So, you know, we could, we didn't have the names of counselors. We had the names of the principals. So the letter went to the principals and we said, please pass this to whoever would be the relevant person for, for college advising. Um, so we don't actually know what happened. And so we could, you know, add a pearl for the, um, um, uh, for the principals and the, and the uh, counselors and try to gather more information about them. There's a lot, I mean, we're going to, continue this for a couple more years because we want to test this other stuff. So uh, if you've got ideas, let me have them. Yep. So try crimson instead of maize and blue or like what? Take out the coupon? <laughs> They had, so we could, yeah, we could, you know, um, they actually, without even telling us, shrunk the size of the package, so the package got smaller. But they didn't do it experimentally, so we don't know. But yes, we could, I mean, that's exactly the kind of stuff, like, so, you know, get rid of the, get rid of the coupons, and, and sort of say, you know, students who look like you, or you're likely to get, you know, if you, and just basically tell them what the Go Blue guarantee is, but personalize it, and see what the effect is. So that's an arm that we would like to try as we expand to more schools. So, you know, everybody in theory is eligible in this group is eligible for the Go Blue, so for some of them we will just push out information about it and say, you're great, please apply. I think that's the next natural step to take. Thank you, lots of great questions. <laughs>